best-selling author living and working in Ireland. Her novels include international bestseller Recipes for Perfect Marriage, which has been translated into 15 languages, and the Irish American Ellis Island Trilogy. Her latest novel, The Dress, is published by Head of Zeus this month. So Kate is actually the pen name of Morag Prunty. Morag uh, left school at 15, worked in a hairdressing salon for four years before entering the world of women's magazines, went on to become the youngest ever person to edit a national magazine, and an award-winning editor of iconic titles such as More and Just 17, during which time you helped launch the career of Take That, mm. which is very interesting. <laughs> In 1991, I'm sure we'll have more questions about that, but <laughs> let's talk about the book. Um, in 1991, you walked out of a media career to fulfill a personal ambition to move to Ireland, um, where you became the editor of Irish Tatler. During that tenure, where I began to write fiction, and then in 2000 had her first book published under her own name, Dancing with Mules, which earned uh, unprecedented advance from Pan Macmillan in the UK and HarperCollins in the US. In 2006, Tired of writing comedy, Kate changed her style of writing completely to more serious emotional tone and became Kate Kerrigan. So I'm really interested to hear about that change as well. Um, and in your new novel, The Dress, Kate references her magazine days with a dual timeline story of a magnificent couture gown made in the 1950s New York, which is replicated by a young vintage blogger in present day London. So Kate's here today to talk about her career journey um, including, I have Take That wearing S&M gear for their first big gig, <laughs> for computers, and what it takes these days to become a published author. She will also hopefully share some of her novel, The Dress, with us. So thank you all for coming. Thanks, thanks a million, Sarah. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what I'm going to say now. I think <laughs> Sarah's just about said it all. Um, well, uh, I'm just, I, I, I was kind of thinking this morning, first of all, what am I going to wear into Google? You know, what am I going to... Uh, and, uh, and then what can I possibly talk about um, to uh, people that work in this like fascinating um, industry about myself that would be of any interest? And uh, so what I thought I'd do is just like run through um, my, my own career and how I came to become a writer because it is, it's kind of a strange job. You know, when I tell people that I'm a writer, uh, people are always just very interested in that fact alone, you know, and the first thing they usually say is, oh my God, you know, like, where do you get your ideas from? How do you come up with ideas for books? They usually say that, or quite often they also say, oh, you know, I would like to write a book, but I just don't have the time, but I've got this really great idea, and if I give it to you, then maybe you'll write it for me, which is just surprising the number of people that say that to me. Um, so I thought I'd just talk for a little bit about myself, if you like, and about my background and my history, if that's something that's interesting. And then uh, maybe you can like just ask me some questions. And then if we've got a bit of time at the end, maybe I might read you a bit from the book and put you through that. Mm -hmm. um, well, just being here in Google, I suppose, is just making me think a bit about my relationship through my uh, quite long career with technology um, as... Um, Sarah was saying in, in the introduction, I left school at 15. I did very, very poorly in school. I could not get on with, no one seemed to be able to teach me anything. Something about the, either the school that I went to or the way that my brain is wired, I just quite simply um, cannot take in information in any, kind of a, um, in any kind of a conventional way. And I went to a very conventional school. So I left there at 15 um, under the cloud, the, the threat of, uh, my parents who were both school teachers saying to me if you don't study hard in school um, you'll end up working sweeping up hair um, in Keith Fisher's hair salon on Brent Street in Hendon and that's exactly what I did <laughs> um, that's exactly where I ended up and I actually started then for quite jolly years hairdressing I rather I rather enjoyed my time as a hairdresser and uh, still um, occasionally if I'm pushed I can cut a mullet, I do a very mean <laughs> mullet, th th those were the days that were in it. Um, and uh, so I did that for a few years, but I'd always had this um, desire, if you like, to, to write and to tell stories, and it was something that I'd, that I'd always done. If you like, I was a bit of a raconteur, and I remember I had this flatmate at the time, and she said, you know, you're always telling these funny stories at parties and everything, why don't you start writing them down? And I did. Um, she then introduced me um, to a friend of hers who was um, a male journalist that worked on Cosmopolitan 
um, kind of a seedy man, and I suppose I was 19 at that time, so um, he certainly took me under his wing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but he believed that I had talent and encouraged me. And then just through a series of coincidental events, it was the 80s was almost a very similar time in a way um, than the now. There was a kind of an optimism and an explosion and an interest in entrepreneurialism. If you like, it was what's happening um, in the online world now with all these startups and everything was kind of happening at that time in the 80s under Thatcher. Of course, she made such a norse of everything that we kind of forget. But at the very beginning, it was quite an exciting time. And I managed to, if you like, blag my way into, um, into women's magazines. I remember my first... Um, the first time I went into a magazine, it was just 17, and I wasn't much more than 17 myself. I suppose I was about 19. And uh, a bit like this morning, I woke up and I thought, oh my God, I, I, got, I, I got an appointment with a man who was one of my Harrison clients' husbands, who was the features editor on Just 17, and I had this thing that I'd written on my electric typewriter. And I was going in to see him, and I just thought, what do you wear? What do you wear when you go into a women's magazine? It was the 80s. And so I put on like, um, in the 80s, um, we, it, the fashion was very much, it was sort of like costumes, you know, it was all very new romantic. And I, I put on, I'll never forget what I wore, a kind of a sailor dress. It was like a sailor dress. And then these big button earrings. And I accessorized it with like, um, with gloves. <laughs> and, uh, I remember I went in to see this guy and I was all done up, you know, like with lipstick and the earrings and, you know, the high shoes and everything, the sailor dress. And everyone in the office was wearing like jeans and T-shirts. <laughs> and uh, this man who was probably in his 30s at the time, which was very middle-aged to me at the time, um, you know, he read my article and he thought it was great and he actually commissioned me on the spot and that was the beginning. And then as I was leaving, um, he looked up and he said, um, where are you going? <laughs> he obviously thought I was going to Henley or something. The minute I'd walked into the office, he'd obviously looked at me and thought, what the hell has she got on? And I was, you know, I was kind of too embarrassed to say, I dressed like this especially for you, you know? Yeah. Um, so that was the start of it for me. And um, I started to get my work published and I was so thrilled because I had never ever dreamt that I would ever be able to get anything published, be a published writer or be a published journalist with no education, no background, no English degree, nothing, that this had just happened, that I was able to write things and that people were willing to publish them. And this seemed to me to be uh, miraculous, and it still does actually to this day and 30 odd years later. This seemed to me very miraculous. And so driven by that kind of feeling that, oh my goodness, anything can happen, um, I became um, quite ambitious. But not ambitious, I don't think, in the way that, that we kind of understand it, but almost ambitious in a way of, um, goodness me, I wonder if, uh, I wonder if they'd actually, someone would actually give me a full-time job. So I applied for full-time jobs, and then someone did, and I thought, goodness me, what would happen if I actually applied to be an editor? And so I did, and then they did make me an editor. And so I went on like this and um, ended up becoming editor of uh, a number of very successful young women's magazines. And I suppose I wanted to talk a bit about technology as well, because it was just what's so... One of the reasons why I love technology so much in my life today is because that too seems slightly miraculous to me. You know, that, that when I started... When I started work in women's magazines, I had an electric typewriter. And but my parents bought me an electric typewriter in my late teens. And that was, that was like, oh my God, that was like, that was just like the most super duper duped up Mac you could possibly imagine at the time. You know, you pressed a button and it went pop, pop. And every time you pressed it, it just made this popping sound, you know? It was just unbelievable. And then you'd be kind of pop, 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 pop. Mm -hmm. And it had a... It, it had a, a thing, it, it had an eraser ribbon on it, you know, so that if you wanted to erase something, you know, there was like a Tipex, you had to buy these Tipex erasers, and you'd be nearly making mistakes just to, just to see this happen. So we went on from that then to these Amstrad computers, um, and things, I, I wrote a book actually, I, I was commissioned to write a book for teenage girls at that time, and I, I wrote a book on the Amstrad, 
and the technology changed so quickly at that time that actually I couldn't get the book off the Amstrad <laughs> onto a printer because by the time I'd finished writing the book, the Amstrads were so delete and Max had come in that I had to like, like ring around Europe to find someone that had a, you know, that had a printer that could get the, stu get the stuff off this old Amstrad for me. And then uh, I think when I was uh, in the early 90s then, I remember editing Just Seventeen magazine and then overnight Apple came in and just completely transformed the whole kind of print industry. And we went from, we went from uh, sticking text down on bits of paper, which just seems incredible. I mean, it seems incredible to me now that when I started my career, uh, we were literally, we were typing stuff up on electric typewriters. And then someone, there was another, that was incredibly complicated. Publishing was an incredibly complicated business because there were, there were so many different departments. You had the sticking down the, the words on bits of paper department, and then you had the checking that the words were correct department, and then you had the department for making them all fit, and then you had the department for scanning them. And, you know, it was j just incredible. So I feel very lucky that I saw that period of, that period of time happening. So all the time that I was working in women's magazines, um, there came a point where I felt I was moving further and further away. Even though I was, I was very successful and I was winning awards and everyone thought I was marvellous and the magazines were selling, there came a point where I just thought, I'm not really, really doing what I really, really want to do and what I really set out to do, which was to write stuff down and have people read it. And I was managing people and negotiating salaries and coming up with marketing ideas and all of this other stuff that just didn't seem to have anything to do with who I was anymore. And so I left all of that behind and moved to Ireland and everyone, all of my contemporaries were universally horrified. It was like I was totally moving to the deep south boondocks, which I was. I mean, I literally, when I moved over to Ireland, I went from working in the equivalent company, it was called EMAP Metro, and it was the equivalent company of Google. Everyone wanted to work there. They published Just 17 and Smash Hits and Empire Magazine. We were all very cool. I went from that to working like in a little dingy basement in Dublin with two people and literally no computers sticking things back down onto bits of paper again. So I began a new phase of my life and it took me, it took me a few years to settle. But what I had was, um, what I had done was, I suppose, made a decision, made a global decision that I wanted to commit myself back into myself as a writer, which had been my original intention. And so over the next 10 years, that's what I did. I, I worked on women's magazines in Ireland, which was great, you know, quite successful, and I earned a living and it was fine, but it wasn't like London, you know. And, um, and I continued to write in my spare time, and for a long time, I wrote books and I wrote uh, short stories and I sent them off for competitions and I got lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of rejection. And eventually, um, after a long time, I, um, I got a book deal. Um, and the book deal that I got was very good and it was based on me writing these like high octane comedy novels um, uh, under the name Morag Prunty and that was in, uh, around the year 2000. So I wrote four of those books, and they were fine. They you know, did very well and everything. And then I just took one, one step further away, if you like, from civilization, and moved from Dublin from, I had uh, a son. Mm -hmm. And uh, after he was born, um, I moved from Dublin down to the west coast of Ireland, down to the country, um, and bought a house, which I still live in, which is um, like a nice old house, and it's on the sea. There's like my house, my front garden, the sea, you know, which is great. And, um, and I started to write very different types of books. I started to um, write books that were more romantic, a bit more serious, a little bit less, you know, high octane. And, um, and that was it. My publishers changed my name because there was a turnaround. There was such a dramatic change in style. They changed my name from um, uh, 
Morag Pranchita, Kate Kerrigan, which is also my mother-in-law's name. It's my married name and my mother-in-law's first name, so she's very pleased about that. <laughs> and, um, and that's it. That's like 25 minutes. Does anyone want to ask me any questions or? What was it like changing your, like, that to me that's such a stark change in identity. Really. Yeah. Like you're writing it. It maybe it allowed you more creative freedom to then take a different approach in your writing. But was that sort of something that you embraced? Because it, it sounds like they came to you and said, we're changing your name. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, it is because it's very, I think what I'm always searching for as a writer um, always is the truth. You know, it's the kernel and the truth and um, in life um, and about what it is to be human and about what it is to be a woman. Do you know? So that's really what every book that I write is about. That's what's at the heart of it. And what happens is you come at the, you know, you have the heart of a book and then you come at it from different angles. You know, and like in this book, I've come at it from the angle of what we wear and fashion, mm -hmm. which always appears and has always appeared to me the most, I suppose, because I worked in fashion magazines as well, that what we wear and fashion, everything seems to be, in a sense, the least important thing. And I've always thought of it as being the least important thing. And with this book, I've gone, right, uh, you know, I decided, well, actually, maybe it's a very important thing. What would it be if it was a very important thing, if what we wear was very important, if the clothes that we wore carried the e something of the essence of who we were? And so, in a sense, it doesn't matter to me uh, what the name of the person is that's writing the book. Um, what's important to me is getting to the truth of the story and also the, um, the story itself, the kernel of the book and the point of it. And as a writer, one of the things that I am constantly moving towards is, if you like, separating myself from the story as much as I possibly can. You know, writing is a very personal thing and you do put of yourself in it. But one of the greatest mistakes that you can make as a writer is to be authorial, which is to include, if, if, if you like, to let a, let a story or let a character be affected by who you are in a way and what you think of them. Or um, this happened, I realized this a number of years ago when I wrote a book and um, uh, my, my main protagonist, people were coming back and saying that, you know, my main protagonists were like quite bitchy. They were always like quite bitchy women uh, with kind of like issues. And uh, I realized that what I was doing is I was putting too much of myself <laughs> into my central characters. And you're always much harder on yourself than you are on other people. You know, so because my characters were carrying so much of who I was, I was kind of making them a little bit bitchy and a little bit kind of snipey and a little bit smart, you know. Um, and they weren't as likable because, uh, uh, I don't know, but I, I know that I think as women, well, for me, I have like an essential insecurity just from being a woman <laughs> that I carry around with me. And that was infecting the characters in my books. So I wasn't able to be as authentic with the characters. I was being more true to myself than I was to the characters in the book. So separating who I am from the actual characters. And it's quite interesting because Morag Pronti is my own name and Kate Kerrigan is my pen name. And Morag Pronti is actually a great name and Kate Kerrigan is actually a really boring name. Mm -hmm. But I don't, it, it actually doesn't have any effect on me one way or another because as long as the book gets written and as long as many people as possible buy it, then that's, you know, and read it, then that's all that, all that matters. What I find fascinating is, you know, Every day I meet so many people just trying to discover what they want to do with their life and just one day, even if they discover, trying to get that. And when I see you, I mean, like she's, I see someone that is successful and also doing what uh, she likes to do. Mm. And after listening to your story, I find like very smooth. But what would you say it was a secret? Like just a lot, being in the right place, uh, being open to opportunities. I mean, what would be your, especially also because you're a woman, so I think that for yeah. all, <laughs> all of us, I think it's much more inspirating. I think, well, one interesting thing actually that somebody said to me, um, it, it was a quote from a writer which I thought was fantastic, is uh, what is the single most important thing that you need to become a successful writer? And I can't remember who, who said it, but this person turned around and said, low overheads. 
do you know? And actually, that, that's true. I think that if, if, if you want to, do, like, I am doing what I really, really want to do, but you take risks with that. Do you know? You have to take risks. And it's not the risk of, I'm going to step into the abyss and I'm going to believe that somebody is going to lift me up and I'm going to soar into the sky. You know, you have to kind of think, well, if I step off into the abyss, do you know what? I might fall down for a bit and I might be hanging off a cliff for a while. Do you know what I mean? And maybe somebody will come and save me. and Maybe they won't. You know, you have to be prepared for it to work, but you also have to be prepared for it not to work. And you have to be prepared to be happy for it not to work um, and be okay with that just to do what you want to do. Like I, I moved to Ireland um, in 91 or 92 and I left absolutely at the height of like a really amazing career in publishing. Like it really was. It was like being a star at Google. It was like th at that time, it was the equivalent. And I went over to Ireland and I thought, I'm going to write poems. And I was following, I had a boyfriend as well and he was Irish and I was going to, and I thought everything would be good. And after about a year, I was so miserable. I thought, shit, what? what have I done? Do you know? Like, I've got no money. I'm working in a smelly basement. These people don't even know how to use a Mac. You know, this is horrendous. And I've got absolutely no time to do my writing or anything like that. What have I done? And I applied for a job in the UK. I, I, I thought, right, well, it's only been a year. I'm going to come back. And I applied for a job in the UK and I got blocked and I didn't, I, I didn't get to in interview. It was kind of like a punishment for having left or whatever. But that's when I made a decision. I thought, I'm here now. I came here for a reason. This is what I wanted to do, and it will work out. Mm -hmm. And what's been interesting, it's, being a writer has been a very interesting journey for me because I had 10 years of writing with no success. Then I got a huge book deal. And this was, oh my god, this was the Celtic Tiger years in Ireland and a huge boom time for publishing here. And I thought, this is it now. <laughs> I've got this big deal. Like, I have hit the big time. Um, but it didn't work out like that. I went up, I went down, I went up, I went down. Every year, you never know um, how any book is going to do. You know, it's, you're, going to be, you're always going to be an international bestseller until you're not. Do you know? So you have to be prepared to go along with that. But all through that, with absolute focus, I've, I've just remained absolutely focused since, since making that decision. And because of that, I have a really nice life. Mm -hmm. I don't have, you know, and I, I would say that I have a, a nicer life than many of my contemporaries that stayed in London and did very well and earned a lot of money. You know, I have a lovely house in a beautiful place and I'm doing what I want to do and I have the time to do it. So I think that's it. And I think. If there's one thing that people have said about me is that I, once I put my mind to something, you know, just focus. Sorry. Sorry, um, I actually run a uh, campaign market since the first time I came here. Sorry? I grew up collecting magazines. Oh, so did I'm you? Oh, well, you're much younger than you're. you're, you're <laughs> No, I don't think. I mean, I don't think I would, but I do think it's. A, I think it's a very interesting time in publishing, and I do think that, um, you know, what's happened is just seventeen has folded. Miss, all the all the young women's magazines now have folded. They've gone. Everyone is getting that information online. But what's become very big is um, comics, you know, and that's really the boys collecting comics. So I think that there is actually room in the market for a girl equivalent for that. Comics and graphic novels are huge. The other thing that's, that, so it, it's almost the role of magazines is played. Like girls can get their advice now, all the stuff that they got from the magazines, which was, you know, um, a personal advice, agony aunts, makeup, fashion, all of that, they can get all of that online and they'd be right to, do you know? Um, but there is a kind of, um, there's an increase in uh, book sales interestingly, among uh, young people. Um, one of the trends that I found interesting is that um, young people now in their teens are not using Kindles 
as much as our generation for the very reason that they can't collect magazines anymore because magazines don't exist. They also can't collect albums, records, CDs, all of those things don't exist. So what they're doing is they're buying books and comics. So I think if someone can come up with something that teenage girls can collect, again, that would be, that would be interesting. But our gener I think our generation is my generation of women, of, of people who worked in magazines. One of the things that I find interesting is that if you go online and you Google Just 17, nothing comes up, nothing. It's like we never existed. And I think it's because mine was that crossover generation that literally went from magazines and then we just went, oh, uh, and straight into new technology. And so there hasn't been any preservation of them. Whereas if you look, at mag if you look, at, if you look up magazines from the 1950s and 1960s, loads comes up online. They've all been kind of preserved. So if you have a Just 17 collection, I I don't work very well with the rest of school together, so um, I'm going to ask a question that I know everybody really wants to ask, <laughs> and that is, did you snog Robbie Williams? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> did you snog any of them? No. Aww. But I did get asked out continuously and quite insistently by Jason, mm. who is close your ears, son. <laughs> who is the mo who is to my mind still the best looking member of Tate that with your terrible acne all down his back? Because I was once photographed in bed. I once did a. I once did it when they started out. They all wore. Um, they had this horrible seedy little manager who was trying to push them towards the gay ma the gay market, and he used to dress them up in all this S and M gear. And I did, you might remember that I did a, I did a, I did um, in bed with Auntie Morag with Take That, the time of Madonna, and I got into bed with them in, in a wincy at nighty, and they were all in the nip, and he had, but he did ask me out a few times, but I never went, because actually I thought they were all years younger than me, but then I subsequently found out that they weren't, that they'd lied about their age, so I could have ended. I say it to my husband all the time, don't I? I could, I, I could have been, I could have been married to Jason from Take That instead of married to you. Mm. Just asking about your family, it seems like you have a strong support network, and with those ups and downs, I don't know how I would be able to cope with 10 years of putting my heart and soul into writing and waiting for that big break. Like, what advice or what, you know, how was it for you, like, having that kind of support to get you through that, or was it that you were kind of finding, finding your way at that time? Well, I had that, but I think it's just that it's just dogged determination, and also because if you... If you're a creative person, you know, people have that thing of the, uh, uh, the, you know, I'm going to become a writer and I'm going to sell books. It's not a career choice. It's kind of like a, it's like a vocation. Like if, you, if you're an artist or if you're a writer, it's kind of like a vocation thing. So you have to do it because you really love, you really love doing it. And so, yeah, you do get the support, but you just think, well, what else am I going to do? <laughs> I'm not going to stop writing because someone's rejected me. Right. You know, and maybe I am crap, but, you know, I'm still going to keep doing it. And you always, always strive to get better. You know, I've had a really interesting experience in the, last, um, in the last couple of years. When I was writing this book, I got a new editor, this woman called Rosie de Corsi, and she was, she's an older woman. I don't know how old she is, but she, was, she edited Maeve Binchy and Penny Vincenzi, and she's edited some really amazing writers. And I, I had, before, it was with a new publishing house, and before I... Um, before I submitted this book to them for publication, it had been through three complete rewrites with um, freelance editors. Um, I, edit I, I suppose I'd worked on it flat out for about 18 months before she got it. And her publishing, the CEO of her publishing house was very excited. They bought the book, this is amazing. We love Kate. It's a big change, new publishing house and everything's just fantastic. And then I went out for lunch with Rosie, who was gonna be my big point of contact. And I sat down and we had lunch and everything was nice. And then we talk about, you know, and she sa I said, so I said, she didn't mention the book. So I said, what do you, you know, what do you think? What do you think of the dress? You know, what's, what's, what's the story? And she said, well, she said, it certainly got potential. <laughs> I can see that you know there's you've certainly you've got there's something in there and I thought what like 
I had, I've, I've had, I don't know, 12 books published at this stage. And so for the last year, I've been working with this woman who has just been tearing it up, start again, tear it up, start again. And it's been the mo of all, all of my years of being rejected, 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 have all brought me to a place where I can work with an editor of that caliber who is so determined um, to, if you like, get the book up to the point where it can reach its absolute full potential. And um, th I think the thing about being a successful writer or a successful artist is having enough self-belief and enough detachment from what other people think of you um, and enough desire, the, d the, d the desire to create has to be much, much bigger than the desire for what that creation might end up with. Do you understand? Like, you could, if you create something wonderful, people will think you're great and they'll give you money and loads of people will, you know, buy it or, you know, if you create something great. But all of that has to mean absolutely nothing when you're doing it. You have to be completely separate from it. And so the editing process for this book was unbelievably arduous. But I was able, because of those early rejections, to just say, well, look, this woman isn't here. You know, she literally, all she's doing is focusing on what can we do to make this book better? And I'm focusing on what can we do to make this book better? And at no point is she thinking she can't do it or, do you know? It's a very, like, when you're creating something, you just keep going until it's, yeah. until it's right. Yeah. And um, there is, you do put your heart and soul into it, but if you're not tough, Oh my God, yeah. But I didn't think I would be. And it's, at every point, it, it, it's been incredible working with, with, uh, with, with, with this new editor because uh, what she was able to do is she was able to take what I had written and, if you like, hone it down so that it's more the book that I originally wanted to write than the book that I did originally write. You know, like, she's so skilled that she was able to, because you know, you come up with, you, you have the kernel, the core of an idea, and then you start dressing it up, you know, and you bring in different characters, and then you think, well, I need a modern storyline, so I'll do this character, and then she needs a boyfriend, so I'll bring him in, and you kind of, you dress, you, you know, you dress it up to make the story work, but sometimes the dressing that you put on it isn't, isn't right, and, um, and you have to, you have to trust the people that you're working with and you have to trust your own ability. Like at the end of this book, there's, there's two, the, the, it's um, a, a, a dual storyline. So part of the book is set in the 1950s in America. And that story really, the characters and everything were set, you know, they worked. And then there's a modern storyline, which is um, a young fashion blogger and her best friend and her love interest. And the young fashion blogger and her love interest are two key, they're two key elements in the book. Both of them were completely different people when I started writing the book, and we just killed both of them after having rewritten them both about five times. Yeah. <laughs> but in the end, they, you know, they, they just got killed off. And people find that unfathomably, like, how could that, how could you come up with a character? But, you know, there was, there was one character in the original book I called Liam. He had a history, he had a family, he had, you know... He was good looking. He had, he, had, he had a whole thing going on with him. I could have written a whole book about him. I'd, I developed him so much. And then one day I was talking to Rosie and, uh, and I just said, you know, I just, I've gone off him. I don't like him anymore. And I just killed him and invented someone new. And the new guy that I invented like just went like this. And he's just much better. Mm -hmm. But the book could have gone out. It could have gone out without all of those edits. Do you know, they weren't. But it's just that now it's just, it's much, 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 much better than it was, do you know? And, um, but even things like, you sit down, it's the, it's the bits that, even after all these years, I could spend like a morning writing a paragraph, you know, really honing it, making it beautiful, and then, and then Rosie would just go, <laughs> superfluous. 
But it's the same, it's the same in everyone's job. That must happen to you guys all the time. I've had this really, really great idea. It's really fantastic. And then someone just comes along and goes, no. Can you talk a bit about your writing? Do you write every day or is, are you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, because you can go. I mean, you can go for. Um, yeah, you, ha I ha you have to be. I have to be really, really disciplined. So I have to write every day. Uh, but part of that as well is needs must. You know, because I have to write a book a year. So if you write a book a year, you've got to write a bit of it every day. And I also do. I also have a weekly newspaper column. And you know, at the moment, I'm doing a lot of publicity stuff. So I'm doing a lot of journalism and that kind of stuff as well. So I do. I have to write every single day. Yeah. Yeah, um, there is that. That I think it's it's more theoretical than than anything. Else. I mean, how I work the best as a writer is um, locked away, like completely on my own, in like twenty four hour stints. Um, so occasionally I go off and like I go to like hermitages and places like that, and I might go away for like two weeks, is the longest I've done without speaking to another human being, and I d and I I absolutely love that <laughs> but I very rarely get to do it I might get another two weeks stint next year very rarely but it's funny I was talking to a friend of mine I'm very funny with some of the you know Irish writers and Cecilia Rahern you know Cecilia Rahern and uh, we had uh, uh, had lunch a few weeks ago and she was telling me that she was watching something on the television and it was uh, I don't know some movie and there was this person in a jail cell you know, they were locked in a jail cell and they were sitting over at the window, you know, with like a, a bucket for peeing in the corner. And they were just sitting there kind of writing with a pad and paper. And she said, her and her husband were sitting watching. And he just turned to her and he went, you'd love that, wouldn't you? And she went, yeah. <laughs> that's, what we, that's what we all want, really. That's, that's it. That's all I want to do. You know, and I, I don't get to do I mean, I couldn't live my life like that because I'd go bonkers, but I do dream about it. I'm trying to keep myself alive as long as I can so that when I'm older, that's, that's how I'll live and that's what I'll be able to do. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Do you get distracted by the internet, though? Like, you know, how in terms of research, do you... Do you I am so it? addicted yeah, cause I to... Yeah, because if I was locked away in a room, I would be like, I'll oh, just write yeah. a paragraph and then, oh, I'll just check the... Oh, no, I'm terrible. I use antisocial a lot. Um, I, I'm absolutely, and I'm completely addicted to social media. I've actually had, an, I've got RSI, I suffer from repetitive strain injury, um, and, um, and also arthritis. So in the last um, few months, I've had to completely um, transform my writing practice so that I now, I don't, I don't have the internet on my phone anymore. I'm getting an old lady phone. Um, so that I've, uh, I've had to cut myself off a lot from social media on the phone from being, you know. And I'm now using voice recognition technology to write, which is um, strange. But it, again, it's part of that. It's part of the determination because not being able to write for me um, in the last few months has been um, cripplingly painful emotionally for me to be losing touch with the actual physical yeah. pop, pop, pop of the keyboard. Um, and that every time I sat down at the keyboard, I'd be like in pain. It was just some kind of horrible cosmic punishment. Um, but I've had to master the voice, I've had to master the voice recognition, and which has been really awful. But you know, you just kind of have to do it. Yeah. Or do you sort of write a bit and then go and think, oh, I should actually look at the historical yeah. truth of this? Well, a bit of like both, it. yeah. And I find that actually researching as I go along is better because otherwise what happens is you write... Like, the most important thing for me is emotional resonance in a book. But when you research stuff and you find it interesting, that then becomes fascinating. And so what you want to do is, like, with this book, you just want to keep reeling off lists and describing dresses and reeling off lists of interesting designers that no one's heard of at that time. And you become bogged down in all of that stuff and you lose the core of it. So I tend now to do less research up front. And also, I did a huge amount of research on a book last year <laughs> about um, organic and city farming. 
and um, I, I did like a huge amount of research. I went to New York and I did real research on it and my editor just went, no, I don't like that. And so it's just gone, you know, poof, finished. So I tend to do it. I tend to do it as I go along. Shall I read you like just a five minute passage? Yeah? I'll see if I can. I'm just going to read the beginning bit of it, which is the prologue, which has no dresses in it whatsoever. Oh my God, I can't see anything. Oh, thanks for us, <laughs> just getting the glasses out. Stop. <laughs> you won't find them. Oh, good woman. The school, Ireland, 1935. The schoolmaster found the boy collapsed against a stone wall at the side of the road. His nose was smashed and bloody and his right eye so swollen that he could barely see out of it. Dear God, Francis, what happened to you? The boy looked at him and shrugged. His eyes were defiant, angry. Your father? John Conlon held out his hand to help the child up, but Francis waved him away and forced himself to stand alone. His legs were shaking. He had taken some battering that morning. His father had caught him unawares and dragged him from the bed. To stop himself from crying, Francis reminded himself that he had fought back and given his father as good as he got. It was the first time he'd stood up to his father and that was how Francis knew it was time for him to leave. The last thing Francis wanted was his teacher's pity. He was a man of 15. He could look after himself now. John held out a handkerchief and he took it. I'm leaving anyway, he said, wincing slightly as he put the cotton square up to his nose to stem the flow of fresh blood. I'm going to America. John Condon leaned against the wall with his pupil. He had taught the Fitzpatrick boy from when he was five until last year. His mother had died and his younger brother Joe had been put in with the nuns, so Francis was left alone in the house with his brutal pig of a father. The area they belonged to was broad and remote, a vast hinterland, a vast hinterland of bog and mountain. It was a place where a man could hide his wife and children away from the eyes of the world, but not those of a prying Irish schoolmaster. John Conlon made it his business to know every child in the area and managed to persuade most of the parents to leave them in school until they can read and write. Francis had been with him until he was 13, but had left then to stay at home to nurse his sick mother. Now she was dead and the baby had been taken away, so there was nothing left for him at home. He was a bright young man and John believed he could have a future. However, with a father like that, he never stood a chance. America, that's a long way off, said John. Francis glowered at him. He could feel himself starting to crack. He'd no idea how he was going to get there, but his mother had a brother in New York. And before she died, she gave him a letter saying he would secure Francis a job if he could get himself to America. The only thing Francis knew for certain was that he was never going back home, not ever. I'm not going to sit here and read through the whole bloody book because you're just... Shall I read another little bit? <coughs> we've only got five, although we've only got five minutes. Anyone else want to ask me anything? <laughs> read a bit more. Oh no, I think in any form of creativity, the best thing that you can do is experience life. And in fact, I always say to, well, I, when I have young interns coming in uh, to me, I always say to them, uh, don't study literature in school. If you want to become a writer, if you're very clever, uh, go and study law. Because uh, I think that's a great, and it's all, law is all about language. But no, I think the only uh, way to, uh, I do n certainly do not regret the years I spent writing journalism either um, and working with uh, words. Alan Silito once said, quantity produces quality eventually. And it's true, I think. 
um, you just you have to do it. And the, the years in hairdressing were the best experience I ever had. I mean, by the time most of my contemporaries were leaving university, um, I was able to do things that I had so many life skills. I was able to talk to people and communicate with people and blag my way into jobs and operate a till and have all kinds of useful skills from having left school very young. I do regret not having had an education so far as there are absolute gaps um, in my basic knowledge, even from primary school. That I, I mean, when my husband and son are sitting doing his homework, <laughs> things like geography, and they're kind of going, where's Russia? And I'm going, <laughs> like, if you show me. Do you know, so there are gaps um, and books that I haven't read. And, um, and I do feel personally insecure, uh, which Mary will attest with the fact that I don't have a third level education. I do personally, I do have issues around that sometimes. But no, I think that um, I would never, ever regret going back and I, uh, or want to go back and change anything that I did or didn't do. And I, I would encourage anyone, like if there's something that you want, you know, if there's something that you want to do, just go and do it, you know, because you can't, there is, I mean, God, times that are in it now, I often, you know, look at my mother with her big school teacher pension and all that kind of stuff and think, oh, you know, I could have, you know, but I mean, having, um, you know, as a writer, sometimes I need to have a day job and sometimes I don't, do you know, but I think it's always important, whatever your day job is, to kind of push into whatever, you know, yeah. you want to do. That's it then. <laughs> is that it? Or is that it? All right. Yeah. We're all listening intently. Like exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What advice do you have for new writers? You know, obviously, well, I'm going to assume in, when you were starting out, it would be send, you know, manuscripts to yeah. um, agents, hear back yeah. in mail. You know, what kind of tips do you have for anyone who... Well, I think the most important thing is to write every day and to not be... You know, I think um, I think that there is the I, I think just just to write every day and to keep doing it. Um, it is good to go the conventional route, find an agent, all that kind of stuff, a good publishing house. I think that, but there are so many different routes now for writers. You know, and self-publishing is definitely one of them. Do you know there is, um, and I think that. Um, you know, the other interesting thing about, the, there's a very, very important synergy between writing and technology and, te and, and marketing and what you guys do. I mean, the most important person um, in my publishing house right now is um, the girl that does all of the, uh, the, o the online sales, and it's called like, was it called algorithms? Or what is it, what is that, what is that stuff called? Is it algorithms or yeah. meta? Metadata. I've no idea what it is, but I know that it exists. So I'm very impressed at myself. But metadata, you know, all of that managing metadata and all that kind of stuff, that's all become an incredibly important part of publishing. And it's difficult, like, for writers, because you write books, but really what you want is you want them read. You want people to actually read them. And getting people to read the books, I mean, now that's just all becoming increasingly important, you know? They're the, they're the heroes of our time. I do encourage blogging. I think it's great. And I think that one of the great things about blogging is that the um, level of communication that there is between bloggers and particularly book bloggers and reviewers and all that, you know, people that are passionate about books now. There's a fantastic blogging community out there. I do think, again, finding a market for blogging is the difficult thing, do you know? But I do, I definitely encourage it because otherwise you're, you're writing a diary into a piece of paper. Blogging is the new, is the new diary, really. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting as well. I kind of. Yeah, it's really the 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 YouTube. Yeah, the YouTube thing is, 
is, um, and, and the whole vlogging thing is really interesting. It's just so difficult to kind of, um, it's just so difficult when you're coming in from the outside to know where to begin accessing the good vloggers. Mm. Do you know? Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it is all changing. And voice recognition technology is, you know, I think that's going to come through for a lot of people as well. There's very, very few writers using it. Uh, Terry Pratchett used it, um, but I can't find any professional writers that do it um, apart from me at the moment. <laughs> but it has been very, very good. I think it's important with vlogging and with, with doing anything with the voice to actually see it written down afterwards because the, the, the work that I'm doing at the moment, I think, is actually an improvement on the first draft of my written drafts. But only because when, you're, when, you, when you vlog something, when you write something down with the voice recognition technology, you need to go back and correct it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that, that people don't lose that relationship with the actual written word, because that's the only way to make, writing, to, to make writing thoughtful, is to go back and edit it. Yeah, mm. but that's texting is a different thing as well. Like um, because it, it has got that brevity to it. Mm. Uh, with when you're writing using voice recognition, you put in all the punctuation, and my punctuation has actually improved. Mm. Oh yeah, it's like improved like totally overnight because you have to think about where you, because you you use the natural pauses and you use all the natural, you know. Okay. Now, are we going to finish? Yes. I, I could sit here all afternoon, yeah, yeah, frankly, but so um, not at all. Thank you.